scripture that I wanted to add. But anyway, before we go anywhere, we're going to jump into James chapter 1. We're going to pick up right where we did last week, okay? And um, if you remember, we were in 9 through 11. We, does anyone remember what we talked about? I hope you do. I hope you do. Yeah, finances, the rich and the poor, right? James is talking about the rich person and the poor person. And we said that there's four kinds. There's godly rich and godly poor. And there's ungodly rich and godly poor. And at the end of the day, right, it doesn't really matter whether you're rich or poor, but rather you're godly or ungodly with those finances. We talked about how we need to spend those finances and, and being how do we be godly with those things that God has given us. And so um, he's, James is going to wrap up the section on trials today, and he's going to transition into something else. And he does that in verse 12. If you remember, we already hit verse 12 in week two. Okay, so let's start there. We're going to review that Really quick, if my PowerPoint, there we go. So James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, I'm just going to say this here. I cannot review every week what we talk about in this series. You're going to have to go back to our website. Okay, it would take forever. We've already talked about 12. 12 is kind of a wrap-up statement of the trial section that he talks about. Now, in 13, he's going to start talking about temptation, which is something actually pretty different. Many of us might think trial and temptation are the same. There's actually some very basic differences that mean the world to us when we're dealing with them. We're going to talk about that. I, I kind of think 12 should have been added with 11 as a wrap-up. But anyway, I didn't do it, so it's not up to me. Um, and it's good that I didn't, right? Because I'm not that smart. But anyway, um, we're going to continue in this looking at verse 13. So let's go. So let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil And he himself does not tempt anyone. 14, here we go. Hopefully it's up there. Yep, 14. But each one of us is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my my beloved brethren. Verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought forth, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Now. Like I said, James takes a turn. We already talked about 12 and those crowns. And if we endure trials, we're we're going to be rewarded with eternal life. So we're not going to go there. He takes a turn here and he begins to talk about temptations. Now, we've spent five, four weeks talking about trials. Today, we're going to transfer to temptations. And they're quite a bit different. Let's look at verse 13 again just to let me highlight it for you there just to get another sense of what he's talking about. Let no one say, verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Well, what did we say about trials? God what? God brings trials, right? James tells us God brings trials in our life, but here he's saying God does not bring temptations. Temptations come from the evil one. They're someone different. So you see those, <clears throat> those differences? God brings trials. Satan brings temptations to us. And what I want to do this morning, and we need, I think we need to get a bigger whiteboard, because what I'd like to do this morning is just kind of draw out. I drew this out on my big whiteboard um, in my office. I want to talk about trials and temptations just really quick. and Because I'm a visual person. I like you know, outlines and stuff like that. The first thing that we have to know about trials and temptations and explaining the difference is that I said this in my prayer at the very beginning, God is sovereign, okay? What that means is he's in charge of everything, okay? He does not, um, he has all power. And for a reason that's maybe outside of our understanding, he has allowed Satan certain powers in this world. So at the top of all things, God is sovereign. He's the one that's over 
all things. Nothing happens in this world outside of his control. Okay? Now you say, well, Satan does some stuff. Well, God gave Satan some control, at least temporarily. So we said already last week that God will, in, will directly bring trials in our life. Can you read that? You probably can't read that way back there, but I'm going to need some space. But because God's sovereign, he allows Satan some certain power in this world, and Satan brings temp... Oh, I'm already wrong. Charles, right? I'm a horrible speller. Temptations. Let's see. T-A-M-P-T-Tations. I'm going to abbreviate that temp next time. Okay, so I don't have to do that. God brings trials. Satan brings temptations. We said two weeks ago that the purpose of trials is what? Do you remember? The purpose of trials in our lives? Down the pathway of what? Maturity, right? The trials, the purpose of, ma- of trials are our maturity. That God brings those to mature us in our life. Okay? God will bring trials in order to make us more like his son. Satan, okay, the purpose of temptations, purpose of temptations is what? Sin. I heard someone say it. The purpose of a temptation is to get you to sin. That's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to get you to disobey God's word and somehow, okay? So the purpose is sin, okay? So God brings trials. The purpose is maturity. Satan brings temptations. The purpose is sin. Now we've got some things to do. We have two ways that we can respond. How is our response, right? I'm going to do response. We said if we endure trials, then we become mature. So we've got endure equals, man, my spelling is so bad, um, equals maturity. Our response, okay, over here to sin is if we disobey, if we fail, if we give in, let's write fail, then that equals sin. That's what he wants us to do. But there is also on each of these an alternative response. Okay? When a trial comes in our life, although God brings that trial and he wants us to endure and to become mature, we also have the ability to what? Choose not to. We have the ability to fail. And in that failure comes what? Sin. However, when Satan brings a temptation to us and he wants us to fail, we don't have to give in, right? We don't have to give in. Our response can hear to be to run from sin, to resist the sin, and to what? Mature through that. Okay? So on this side of the board, we have trials. We've got pain which is what the trial is. We talked about that, that there's pain in our life and it's no fun and it's horrible and no one likes it. And when we endure that pain, okay, we become mature, okay? This is a trial. This is like the pathway of the trial, God's intended direction for us. What we've not talked about is Satan's intended direction for us. The pathway of temptation is we have a desire, okay? Then we have disobedience. I'm going to go disobedience, which leads to death. This is the pathway that Satan is looking for us. He's going to present a desire to us. We're going to want something. Then we're going to disobey God's word to get that thing, whatever it is. That leads to sin, and sin leads to death. Do you see the difference here? There are two different things, although we can become mature no matter what is thrown at us. We have the option to not not go into that sinful situation. We have the option to run or resist that temptation and become mature. Okay? I want it for us to talk about for a minute, okay, on how exactly are we supposed to do that? And I've got a, a, a thing up here on the screen. This is the pathway, okay? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Trial, we've got pain. When we endure that pain that God brings in our life, 
we become mature. We, we spend a lot of time on that. Today, what Satan's trying to get us to do is have this desire and then follow that desire through disobedience. And that will lead to our death. You see three D's down there on temptation. I want for us to talk about these three, day, these three D's. And the first one there is desire. Okay, Temptation always start with some kind of desire. Something you want. Okay, I'm on no carbs right now. I'm doing Adkins diet. Okay, Oh my goodness. Like Right now I'm thinking about those chocolate candies over in 404. I have a strong desire for those stinking chocolates right now. I've not had a chocolate all week. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? Like you're freaking out? Yeah, like yesterday I cheated. I had about a half dollar size of the tortilla at the barn bash yesterday. And Lori's like, give me that thing, right? And so I've got, we've got these desires. We all want things, okay? The, the temptation starts when there's a desire that comes across our path. Maybe it's a vision, something you see. Maybe it's, you know, a hot chick walking down the road and guys are like, what's up, girl? You know, or, it's a, or you see something. Maybe it's something you hear. Maybe it's just a thought that all of a sudden pops into your brain. There are desires that come upon us that, you know, when I was in youth ministry, a lot of the boys would say, well, how do I control these things that pop up? I can't control what I see. And I said, yes, you can actually control what you see. We have lots of control over the things that we see or hear by us putting ourselves in certain situations. We're going to talk about those in a second. For instance, let me just talk about control. Guys, if you, if you struggle with lust, then you probably shouldn't be on the Internet anymore. Okay, that's just simple, right? Because it doesn't matter if there's a banner, whatever website you're on, there's going to be something there. You, when you're driving your truck down the road, don't look left. Don't look right. Just stay straight ahead. If you struggle with gossip, don't go in the break room at work, right? Because you can control what you hear by not going there. Okay, um, there are, if you struggle like me with carbs, don't go to Dunkin Donuts and meet someone for coffee. Right. I'm a meet for coffee at Dunkin Donuts. It doesn't work. Like I met Armando, my, my church planting mentor at Neater's the other day. And I'm like, why did I do that? Right. You guys all know Neater's bakery. Some of you are like, oh, why did he do that? It was stupid. Right. It was so stupid of me to do that. But there are things that come in to our our life, whether visual smell them right some of you smell mm, mm, that smell it reminds me of an ex-girlfriend or what you know what I mean like there are so many senses that we have that can bring a certain desire to us and we need to be careful of those things so let's 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 look especially at desire and what it does it means that we all want something okay a desire is not a bad thing in fact, God says that he gives us the desires of our heart whenever we follow him. Look at this. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So not all desires are bad. Okay, we can't just say, oh, I can't, I, I don't want to desire anything. Some desires are good. If there were no th such thing as desire, humans would cease to exist, right? I mean, if you didn't desire a sexual relationship with someone else and get married and have kids, we would be extinct, if you didn't desire to get better, you'd never go to school and you'd sit at home watching SpongeBob all day, getting, you know, 5,000 pounds and you'd die. Like, you, you, we, desires are good in life. Some desires. Now, that's the trick. What are the desires that are good and what are the desires that are bad? The desire is, right here, the beginning of our pathway. Okay? They're the beginning of our pathway in temptation, and this is what Satan uses to get our attention, okay? And for each of us, it's a little bit different. Each of us struggles with different temptations. Some of us will struggle with gossip. Some of us will struggle with whatever, overeating. Some of us will struggle with anger. Some of us will struggle with lust. Some of us will struggle with gambling. Some, whatever it is. We all have different temptations that are going to come, and we're free to pursue those things, or not pursue those things. There's freedom here. Folks, there's freedom. Just because a temptation comes does not mean we have to give in. We have the option. We can fail like Satan wants us to. Or we can run from it. We can resist the temptation. And then turn that. Like, like tell Satan, ha ha, good try. I just became more mature because of that temptation. Because I ran or I resisted it. Okay? We have an option here. Now, 
How do you know whether something that is a desire is good or bad for you? Like, do you need the pastor to walk around with you all day? Like, Eric, I'm going to walk around with you all day and say, you should do that. Nope, shouldn't do that. You should do that. Nope, better not do that. All of us, okay, every single one of us has God's thumbprint on us, okay, whether you're a believer or not. There is something inside you, whether you believe in God or not. There is something inside you that tells you whether something's right or wrong. And that's how we, that's how we explain why there's a God and why God created the universe, because you can't explain the moral code, right, if it's just evolution. Who designed the right and wrong in the world? All of us have that. But if you're a believer here today, you've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside you, which will guide you, convict you about what's right or wrong, right? He'll convict you about whether you should do that or not. And then we also have the Bible. The Bible is chock full of right and wrongs, right? It tells you what to do in this situation, what not to do. It gives us a list of laws, a very simple thing to follow. So how do I know? This is what teenagers used to always tell me. Well, how do I know whether it's wrong, right? It's really simple. Most of us know whether, what's, you know, whether what we're doing is right or wrong. Wrong. The Bible spells it out. So whenever we decide to pursue those things that God prohibits, that becomes disobedience. Look at James 14 again. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Okay, This is in the ESV this time. And the reason I put that is because it's using these words that we're talking about. Desire or lust, which is what the NAS, NASB said. We're lured away and enticed by our own desire. And then that desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when it's fully grown, brings forth death. That word conceived there, that's, that's when that thought, that desire, mixes with your action, and all of a sudden, you've got some, you've got some disobedience on your hand. Like there's a thought, and you're like, oh, I can, do, I can throw that thought away, or I can pursue that thought. I can say, oh yeah, I need to go down that road. And that's when disobedience starts to happen. Many teenage boys, when I was the youth pastor, would say, well, how much can I think about a girl without sinning, right? Like, how, where is the line? When does, when does my thought pattern become sin pattern? That's a valid question. We actually talked about this in Connect Group like last year sometime about when does our thoughts turn into sin whenever we're thinking about whatever it is that we're thinking about. Jesus answers this in Matthew, okay? He answers it in Matthew chapter 5. Sermon on the Mount is talking very plainly about what we should do and not do, how we ought to live. Look at this. He says, and many of you have read this. You've heard what it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Sin starts in your heart. Okay? It starts in your heart. When that thought is played with, when that thought is focused on, when that thought is dreamed about or whatever, then I believe that you've actually sinned when that's a disobedient thought. Now, obviously, you can think about your wife all day long. That's great. Uh, but not the lady next door. Okay? Now, think about this for me. Put yourself in this scenario. Most of you are from Yuma. You're driving down 4th Avenue, let's just say, okay? Driving down 4th Avenue about 2 o'clock today, okay? And you're in the right-hand lane. You're heading, uh, let's say, southbound. Uh, You're in the center lane, okay? So there's the right one and then the left one and then the center and then the two. You're in the kind of fast lane. You're driving down. And a huge Ford F-350, big old truck with Alberta plates, right? Okay, you know where I'm going, right? You know where I'm going. You're in your little car, and this huge snowbird is in the right lane, and he sees Chevron over here, and immediately, I mean immediately, turns left in front of you and the oncoming traffic and everything, and the first thing you want to do is raise your finger as high as you can raise it, right? But you don't because you have an Ecclesia sticker on your truck, right? And the first, you're thinking, you beep, 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 but, but, but you don't because your kids are in the car, Friends, it's, you've done it. You've sinned. That reaction, although it's, I don't want you to do those things. 
But what Jesus is saying here, when you want to do it, when you're doing it in your head, it's done. Okay? We need to react differently. Fellas, when you go into the doctor's office and the receptionist is sitting there and you walk in to check in and she's got a low cut top on and you can see everything but the kitchen sheet in the sink, right? I mean, like you're there and you gaze and you look and you enjoy the view, right? And then you go and you sit in the waiting room for an hour because that's what it takes in Yuma. It takes an hour at least to see a doctor, right? And you think about that, friends. You may have not touched that woman, but you have sinned with her, okay? Ladies, maybe, or maybe this is a guy, maybe one of your friends does something horrible and he's like, you know, he's in trouble, he's in jail actually, and it's, you know, it's this crazy situation. And like, you don't want to gossip, but you want to tell somebody. So you call your Christian friend, you go, meet me at Starbucks. We need to pray for someone, right? And you, you say, hey, Sally, we need to pray for this person. Let me tell you the story. And you've just cloaked your gossip in a prayer request, okay? You've sinned. Think about what the heart is of the issue that's going on, okay? And if you can stand before God saying, I'm, I'm clear with this, and, and your, your conscience is clear, and the Holy Spirit isn't convicting you, like, you're fine. Like a lot of us, though, we struggle with those things, especially us good Christians, right? The ones that have been Christians for a while that have the Ecclesia sticker on our car, people that know that we're Christians in our brain, we have a completely different life than our outside life. Like, we've got it controlled outside. But do we control what's going on in our brains? Jesus takes it to another level and says, what's happening in your heart and your brain counts too, okay? So we need to be very careful about what we think and also, obviously, what we do on the outside. When desire turns into action, whether mentally or physically, it becomes disobedience. Let's look at the last D, death, okay? Death, desire, disobedience, and then death. Look at what James says here, verse 15. And then sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death, right here. Desire leads to disobedience, which leads to death. Paul said the same thing in Romans 6.23. We've talked about this verse time and time again. For the wages of sin is death. Right? It's death. Eternal separation from our Father. Meaning spending eternity in hell. That's what sin gets us. And then there's my favorite word in the whole Bible, which is what? You guys know it? But. Right? Favorite. Did a whole series on the big buts of the Bible. But, this verse isn't over, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have been offered a gift of grace. We don't have to die. We don't have to spend eternity without the Savior because we have been offered grace and all you have to do is receive that gift. Okay? So what do we do? What do we do when we're tempted? What is it that we actually do? And here's what I want to do with us for the next couple minutes, okay? What I, what I propose this morning is I want you to be the preacher. I, get you, I give you these guys a, a, an option every once in a while, okay? I want you to, with the people around you really quick, I want you to come up with an acronym, okay, which is R-U-N, okay, that talks about how we can deal with temptation. I'm using the word run. I think we ought to run from temptation. Okay? We have several examples in the Bible of running from temptation. Remember Joseph runs out of there. It's Pharaoh, or I'm sorry, Potiphar's wife is chasing him. She wants him. He runs. So what I want you to do is with the people around you really quick, take two minutes. You only get two minutes because Jenny's going to kill me, right, if I don't. You get two minutes if you're the preacher. What would you say, and you, maybe you don't have time to do all the R, U, R, okay? What would you say? What would your sermon point be in telling people how to resist temptation, how to run from temptation, how to deal with temptation? So take two minutes right now, come up with something really good, okay? Really good. Let's see what you got. And then I'm going to ask you. Go. Let's hear what you got. So basically, I didn't study the rest of my sermon. You know what I mean? No. I'm looking for preachers is what I'm doing. This is like, you know, batting practice right here. Um, let's, let's hear what you got. Let's, let's see. Let's write some of these things down. Someone tell me one of your R's. 
Oh, yeah, all right, Jenny. Jenny's going to be preaching next week. What do you got, Jenny? Come on. Recognize. Recognize. Okay. Understand. Okay. Say no. Okay, yeah. What are we going to recognize? Recognize the situation, okay? Better recognize. Okay, yeah. Understand that. How about understand the consequences? That's my point. <laughs> okay, anyway, what, what else? Who else? What did you get something different? Anyone else? R? Refocus? Yeah. Unleash? Yeah. And new leaf? Okay. I like that. Don't hold him in my spelling. Anyone else got any others? Neutralize? That's the word I use, man. You guys are, we're on the same page. Neutralize. Anyone else? Got any others? Never give in. I hear that. Never give in. I had that as one of my points this week, and I killed it because I like neutralize better. Anyone else got any others? Not act. Huh? Not act. Not act on it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So here's why I do those things. I want you to, like, make it yours. You know what I mean? Like, if you were to write a sermon, you'd write it to yourself, which is what most people do, okay? And I want you to think about those things that you talked about. I'm going to share what, what I wrote down this week while I was studying, and I've got it up on the screen. I put, re- rely on the Holy Spirit for R, okay? And I'm speaking to believers here. If you're not a believer in Jesus, then you don't possess the Holy Spirit, Okay? Um, but I, I can see most of us in here are, and so I'm talking to the majority of us, rely on the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, you have a temptation resistor built into you, okay? You absolutely have a, a temptation resistor built into you that's God in, inside of you, okay, to resist that temptation. Now, in your bulletin, I put a card, a little memory verse card. I think it's orange, this is, a, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which we have up on the screen. Um, I, uh, oh, yellow, sorry. I never know. I just grab some cardstock and do them. Um, I'm not colorblind. I just didn't know. Um, I, I memorized this verse right when I became a Christian um, because it was a verse that was a memory verse in the Experiencing God workbook um, that I worked through with uh, Pastor Gilbert Tager up at Morningside years ago, okay? This verse will help you in times of need. It'll help remind you that the Holy Spirit's there, okay? It'll help remind you about what's going on. It says, I don't know if I've got it correct on the screen, but it says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can spare. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that way you can stand up under it. This is a verse that we need to know, friends. It's a verse that we need to have on our hearts. Because when those things come, when those temptations come, we need to know that God has already provided a way out. Okay, He's already provided a way out. His word says that he has. He's going to give you a way out. Now, we have to be very very careful here because a lot of us, okay, a lot of us like to test God in this. It doesn't say to test God here. It says to test God with your finances, okay? A lot of us like to get so close to that sin, so close to that sin, get so close to it, so close to it, so close to it, and really hope and pray that God gets us out of the middle of it when we have already passed 10 opportunities to get out of it, right? Ten opportunities to get out of that sin, we've already passed up. 
And a lot of us, especially teenagers, okay, especially teenagers, they like to get so close to that sin and so close to it and then ask God, get me out of here. And God's like, I already had my hand out for 40 minutes ago, right? I've had my hand out for you and you, you're, you're, you're already in it. You're already in the middle of it. We tend to test God. Think about um, when you're dating someone, and we have some people dating here, and we've got teenagers here, and, and you know, in dating, when you're dating someone, you, you want to be with them physically, and so you hang out, and then that, it, eventually those people will come to my office and say, we've, we've sinned, we, we've slept together, and we don't want to anymore, and so how do we not do that? How do we keep that clear in our lives, that those temptations away from us and uh, you know it just seems like we ask God to protect us but we're, when we're in bed together we can't seem to keep our hands off each other like don't get in bed with each other right don't put your hand in the cookie jar when it's not supposed to be in the cookie jar expecting your hand right to resist the temptation when it's in the cookie jar there were plenty of opportunities to be um, to be taken out of that situation by God that you just blew past Let's not test God in that. Let's have some very wide boundaries. You, let's continue. We're never going to get done. You, understand the consequences, okay? One of you wrote, understand. I said, understand the consequences. A lot of times, we get so wrapped up in that desire that we can't see the reality of it, and we don't realize what would happen if we were to fail. This is something that I did as a young person um, that, that really helped me, okay? I, hang, I hung out with some people that, you know, would smoke pot or whatever, and they're just, it's just pot. Just try some. And I, in my brain, I had this, you know, worst-case scenario going on, and I still do this today. Well, if I smoke pot, I know that uh, my, you know, my real dad, he's an addict. And for me, I know I'm an addict. I, I, I've never done any drugs, but I know I'm an addict. I have that personality. When I do something, I want to do it again, and I want to do it again. I don't just eat one butterfinger. I eat 12 butterfingers. Do you know what I mean? And so, like, that's my personality. I know if I'm going to smoke pot, then I'm going to want to do it again next weekend. I'm going to want to do it next weekend, and then that's going to turn into whatever, and that's going to turn into whatever, and then I'm going to be smoking meth, and I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going to lose my job at work, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to, I wanted to be an FBI agent I couldn't be an FBI agent and then I'm um, you know robbing the circle K friends that, that's like it, some of you might laugh right but that is the path of many people okay that is the path of many people and that little tiny sin that you think is not that big of a deal can many times when you talk to people that are way far gone they said had I not only done that little thing whatever that is men you might think, it's just, well, it's just an image on a computer. It's no big deal, okay? I do this all the time. I say, well, if I look at that image, and I'm going to probably look at more images, and then I'm going to look at more images, and I'm going to watch a movie, and then I'm already committing adultery on Lori in my heart, and so then, you know, what's to say I wouldn't stop and try to uh, go find another woman, and I find another woman, I leave her, and then I lose my kids, and I lose my job, obviously, and I lose this. Am I going to do look at that image? No. I'm not. I don't want anything to do with that. Because what I do is I play out the worst case scenario. And it helps me understand the real consequences of what seems like maybe a simple little thing. But it puts things in perspective for me. I think a lot of times we need to understand the consequences and realize the perspective that those things can bring us. Let's look at N. I did say neutralize, Chris. Neutralize the sin. We need to do whatever it is possible that we have in our strength, okay, to neutralize that sin, to get rid of it. Neutralize it, get rid of that sin. That means leave. That means run away. That means don't play with it. Don't be where the sin is. Uh, we talked about Joseph. Literally, Joseph runs. If you know the story, we were going to share it. Joseph, I mean, he had been sold into slavery. We talked about this two weeks ago. Sold into slavery. Then he's taken into Potiphar, who's this kind of leader in Egypt. And he's taken into this house, and, and he's then raised up in, in, in power. And he's great, and he's doing everything. And Potiphar's wife 
She, she likes him, and she says, sleep with me, sleep with him. He's like, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm not going to sleep with you. How could I? I, I disobey God. I disobey my master. I've got all this stuff. I'd lose it all. I'm not going to sleep with you. And so it, the scripture says that he did whatever he could to avoid her. Okay? And then one day when she was by herself and he was in the house, she came in and she grabbed him, and he's like, get away from me. I don't want you. you know? And when he ran, she grabbed a piece of his clothing. And then she screamed, he raped me, he raped me, he raped me. And he was ultimately, you know, thrown in jail again. A false accusation. But we know that there was good that came of that, right? Ultimately, he's taken into Pharaoh's house and lifted up and in uh, authority and all these things. Becomes second over all of Egypt and he's able to save his family. Joseph ran. Okay? He ran. He understood, like he... He relied on the Holy Spirit to resist that woman's sexual advances for who knows how long. Probably a long time. He understood the consequences. He talked about them. Genesis 39, look it up when you get home. Talked about, look, God, I, I, how can I sin against God? I've, I've been given all this authority. I don't want to lose that. And then he neutralized the sin. He did whatever he could to stay away from this woman, including physically running away from the situation. Some of us need to run, okay? It's just reality. Some of you need to run from a relationship. Some of you need to run from a place you hang out. Some of you need to run from thoughts that you've continued to have for years. You need to run. You need to get away from that stuff. It's like I just talked about, like the, the you know, a mom bakes a bunch of cookies, puts them in the cookie jar, Right, and says, not until after supper. And then little Johnny comes in, you know, 20 minutes later, and she hears the cookie jar, you know, open, and he's got his hand in there. And you know how moms are, they know. She's in the other room, what are you doing, Johnny? And he's like, I'm resisting temptation with my hand in the cookie jar. You know, like that's, that's what we do, right? So many of us do that. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. It's a silly way to live, and it's a very dangerous way to live. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit, we need to understand the consequences and neutralize the sin that's in our life. And that means get rid of it any way possible. Okay, Disassociate with that person. Break up with that person. Don't go there. Don't drive down that road anymore. And a lot of us say, well, how can I help these things? There are so many things you have the power to change in your life. If you know there was a street that you used to buy dope on, don't ever drive down that street again. Okay? Don't ever call that phone number again. When you see that person, you may not be, there may be some things you cannot control for sure. Someone all of a sudden pops up in your face, you know, and you're like, whoa, get out of my face. Like, run, right? See you, dude. I got to go to the bathroom really bad. No one's going to, you know, that's always my, that's always my go-to. Whenever I got to get away from someone, I got to go, you know, and no, nobody ever questions that because we all know, okay, that's just how life is, right? It, it, blame it on diarrhea, you know? I'm serious. Who's ever going to question that? Right? Are any of you? You don't have to go when you're chasing them away. That's, that's never going to happen. Right? That's just reality. we got to do whatever we can do in our power and then through the power of the Holy Spirit to resist temptation and to run from it. I pray that you do. Why don't we close? Uh, worship team, you guys come on forward. I'm going to pray for the offering. Martine, if you'll um, have someone help you do that, that would be awesome. We're going to have the offering in just a second. And if you've got a connection card, if you've got a prayer request, and if you need to let me know about the Power Pack dinners or whatever, um, you can do that on a connection card, and they're going to take those up in just a second. Let me pray. Father, I thank you.